Good afternoon and uh, welcome everyone uh, to today's program on pandemics past, present and future. We have with us uh, Thomas Abraham and Chinmay Tumbe. Uh, Thomas has been a journalist for much of his career working with the Hindu and South China Morning Post. He has also been a consultant for the World Health Organization and other international organizations on risk communication. Uh, he subsequently worked at WHO headquarters in Geneva during the influenza pandemic. Thomas is the author of two highly regarded books, 21st Century Plague, The Story of SARS, and Polio, The Odyssey of Eradication. Uh, we also have with us Chinmay Tumbe, who is a faculty member in the economics area at IM Ahmedabad, where he has helped set up uh, the IM Ahmedabad archives. Chinmay's first book, India Moving, A History of Migration, was published in 2018. And his second book, The Age of Pandemics, 1870 to 1920, How They Shaped India and the World, was published in 2020. Chinmay is also a member of the Lancet COVID-19 India Task Force. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, Thomas and uh, Chinmay. Thank you for joining us, Thomas. Uh, thank you, uh, Chinmay, for being with us this afternoon. Uh, let me begin with a question uh, which uh, sort of uh, draws from your books. Both of, both of you have written uh, very important books on pandemics. Uh, Thomas, yours was on a recent pandemic, SARS, while uh, Chinmay, you published a book on cholera, plague, and influenza in the 19th and early 20th century India. Now, there are two complementary ways to look at pandemics past and present in terms of uh, what is common to them and in terms of what is uh, different about them. I mean, there are always going to be things which are common across pandemics, irrespective of, say, in the 19th century, you had different uh, kind of scientific knowledge. Uh, in the 21st century, we are somewhere else. Uh, you know, in terms of population growth, population density, our understanding about disease, uh, health in general, these are things which have changed. So there's going to be some things which are, there are going to be things which are different and there are going to be things uh, which are still similar. Now, tell me what you see as different and what you see as uh, similar across these pandemics from the 19th to the 20th century. Thomas, I'm going to ask you this first because your book is on a more recent uh, pandemic, SARS. And in that case, uh, the country of origin was pretty much, uh, was exactly the same, China as uh, as in uh, the case of SARS. Uh, so what do you see as different or similar between uh, from you know, the, the time of SARS to uh, COVID-19? Thank you, um, and thank you for having me. Um, so well, I think 2003 SARS was probably best described as a baby pandemic. So I'm not quite sure that <laughs> this is a very accurate epidemiological term uh, because its spread was relatively limited um, and it's nowhere near uh, where we are uh, today. So uh, the similarities, of course, are the place of origin, uh, the geographical place of origin, both were in China, um, and actually the nature of the emergence of this disease. They both come from the same coronavirus family. Uh, they are both that origin, um, and they both passed from bats to human beings through intermediary animals and began to spread among human beings with very similar symptoms. Um, the big dif difference, of course, is that um, SARS-CoV-2, as the virus that is causing COVID-19 is technically termed, perhaps the son or the grandson of SARS um, has learned a lot <laughs> over the last uh, 20 years. It, it transmits far better. It is far better adapted to hu for human to human transmission. And, 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 and these, are, these are animal viruses, which, are, um, which take a while for um, adaptation to human beings. But this one seems to have, I mean, really hit the ground running. Um, and of course, it spread globally um, to a far greater extent uh, than the original SARS or between 
2003 SARS and COVID-19 today, we also had MERS, uh, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, which is another coronavirus uh, disease. But that once more was geographically uh, pretty well, uh, sort of well-defined. It didn't spread except for one incident in South Korea. It did not really spread beyond the Middle East. So um, these, I guess, are some of the similarities and, and, and differences. Now, the question really, the million dollar question, and I'd love to hear Chinmay on this as well, is what have we learned, right? Because um, if there is one constant in human history, um, in the history of our, of our species, it is the fact that pathogens, whether it's virus or bacteria, pass from and a variety of animals to human beings. And we are also animals, right? And so we are animals. We live in cl uh, close proximity throughout history with other animals, um, especially after the agricultural revolution when we started uh, you know, learning how to herd cattle and so on and so forth. And so this has been a constant strain in our history. Pathogens pass from other animals to us. The question is, what have we learned from this? And I know science has progressed immensely, right? Um, the whole concept of pathogens and the viral or bacterial or fungal origins of disease were completely unknown, maybe two, three hundred years ago, even during the time of the plague. Nobody was quite sure what it was. Um, were these diseases caused by bad air? Was it caused by bad people? Was it caused by witchcraft? And these were all, in a sense, equally plausible explanations that we had. And since then, of course, our understanding of diseases, of the natural world and how diseases pass, of our ability actually to sequence the genes of a virus, I mean, the tiniest, tiniest particle that is imaginable, right, is amazing. So here's the big question, and this is a question I'd really like to put to all of you as well. How much have we really learned? Because at the end of the day, and um, Chinma, I was actually reading your, uh, with great interest, your, 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 your chapters on the 1918 pandemic. Um, and people basically did the same thing. I mean, there were some medical officers, there was medical advice to wear masks. This is followed uh, in Japan and in, in, in Northeast Asia. In fact, this is when mask wearing became really big because people actually did it. Other parts of the world, they were much more skeptical, but wear masks. And if you go back to the plagues of the Middle Ages, once more, you had, I think we have these iconic images of the plague doctor, you know, sort of dressed up with this long beak with herbs, primitive masks, right? So we're doing the same things. We try, we all, we still believe that diseases are brought to us by others, by people different from us. And this is something I think that is deeply rooted in, 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 in our psyches. Probably it is in, in, our, in, our, in, our, in our genes, if you will. Maybe that is why our species have survived, you know, these 250, uh, 300,000 years. Um, we see exactly the same thing. So the first thing that happened um, in, uh, um, in last year, in January, February 2000, was stop Chinese people from traveling, coming to your country. And many countries, um, the US, India, thought that would be sufficient because this was a Chinese virus, right? So you keep Chinese people out, then... Um, so. Um, you had villages definitely during lockdown one. I'm not quite sure. It, last year's lockdown here in, in India where basically barriers, barricades were put up to keep people, you know, outsiders away and so on and so forth. Um, and to be honest, these are pretty, uh, these are pretty good ways provided that it, it you know, it, it doesn't travel too far. But the fundamental thing is we see disease as something brought by outsiders, right? And we see ourselves apart as from outsiders. This could be outsiders, different ethnicities, different religions. We're always looking for, this couldn't be us. Or it could be people from a different class, right? Uh, poorer people are bringing in disease. And this is a constant thread through our history. 
That hasn't changed. And this is something for which there is absolutely no scientific reason, right? Because we are all human beings, a virus is a virus. We are a collection of, of cells, including viruses you know, in, in, our, in our DNA. And it's really a biological process. And as a species, we are biologically very, very, we're sort of near identical, right? Uh, with tiny differences at the margin, which define us as individuals. But um, our social response really is to blame somebody else for this and take measures that are often uh, not uh, unscientific. And we probably we often look at the, at the wrong enemy, right? The outsider. And I mean, the classic example was, is, is I mean, everybody is looking at, at, at Chinese people, but this was already in Europe, it was in Asia, it had already reached, the first cases had reached the United States by, you know, the first week of, of, of February, right? It was already, once it's there, it's yours. It's transmitting within you. And the same thing happened, you know, from January 30th onwards, clearly within this country, uh, this had already started spreading. Um, and we have uh, papers from early studies from the ICMR as, as well, which said that it is not going to be very useful to have this border. Keeping out foreigners is not going to be, it'll at the most bias a little bit of time. But uh, this, is this is what we always do. Um, I think I'll stop there. I think so these are some of the similarities is obviously that uh, between the way we respond to these. Um, despite our scientific knowledge um, and the fact that both these diseases are pretty similar. Um, on the other hand, we of course have learned a lot, but I think I'll wait, um, and maybe I'll let you, uh, you know, sort of, uh, I'll come back to that and what we have learned, uh, maybe I'll bring that and you know, we'll talk about that a little later. Okay, uh, thanks Thomas. Uh, Chinmay, how would you respond to the question uh, the, the, the elements of uh, the similarity and, and uh, differences across, uh, you know, uh, 100, 200 years, uh, yep. 19th century, to early 20th century, and now. Uh, what do you see as uh, different yeah. and similar across these pandemics? Yeah, I think I'll start with the, the most famous word of last year, which is this word called immunity, right? And how we ourselves uh, think we are immune uh, to uh, many other diseases. And I think the context of the pandemics, which I looked at, is very different from what Thomas looked at, you know, 1817 to 1920, basically cholera, plague, and influenza, happened at a time when actually Indians in particular, you know, we didn't really have food. We had famines. So the context was uh, not just malnourishment, which still exists, but undernourishment, which means uh, basically people not getting, you know, two square meals a day. Right? So the context was that infectious diseases could pick out people the death rates were just abnormally high. You know, the life expectancy rates of Indians in the late 90s were just about 20 years. Today, it is 70 years. So there has been, of course, tremendous progress made in you know, cutting down a variety of infectious disease. But this fact that people knew back then that if you were working in the military, you got basic food supplies. You know, influenza, as I point out, very few people in the uh, military, both Indian soldiers and British soldiers, died. You know, very people, even in jails, actually, because they had basic food rations, you know, they didn't. So, it's precisely those places where there was a severe drought, people didn't have food that, you know, the influenza really carried. And that's what we're seeing even now. You know, incidence rates are going to be fairly uniform across in India, just like it was in 1918. But it's a death rate which is going to be slightly higher. That could be because no oxygen, you know, reach certain places uh, and so on. But, you know, building on immunity, today's world, we don't really think just because we, you know, we are hatta katta, we eat some meals that, you know, we are, there's a, there's a, I think with the last one year, we went through this public debate of, you know, stuff like natural immunity and all sorts of stuff, you know, floating around, uh, great diets of the Indians. We can never, you know, uh, uh, I mean, I remember one of the reasons I wrote the book was precisely because all of this was floating around last February, you know, uh, not this February, but February 2020, where people said, A, all pandemics originate in China, which is not true, you know, the cholera was very endemic in India, uh, B, that in Indians are, you know, not prone to uh, uh, falling, uh, say, and because we kind of, went through that first wave relatively milder, not just India actually, I mean, pretty much all the world except for, you know, a few countries in the West. There was this kind of massive kind of uh, 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 a complete erasure of, you know, what has happened in the past uh, where countries have been devastated. And so I think there was a kind of complete false sense of security, which was derived by this idea of, you know, natural immunity, uh, which I think has been shaken to the core 
about now. So that's one thing which, uh, you know, I think the context is very different from then and now. Then it was just about food supply. Today, India is sitting on 40 million tons of you know, uh, food stocks. Food supply per se is not the issue, but then still we are kind of nervous, you know, now suddenly. Last year, we wanted this false sense of security. Today, we are. Uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about this, also this relationship between economics and epidemiology. Because I'm a trained economist, you know, I'm not a trained scientist. Uh, uh, you know, in the 19th century and now, obviously the people who want commerce, the wheels of commerce to be moving, are going to be the last people to respond in order to curtail economic activity to contain a pandemic. But the thing is, we know pandemics require very hard trade-offs and that certain restrictions do need to be put in place and that will hurt economic activity, right? And so what's interesting for me is that what, that's one thing very similar is that the leading global powers back then and you know last year, uh, which was UK back then, the British empire in the 19th century and America last year, both were so dismissive of the pandemic. You know, the British were the last people and both of them espoused this sort of laissez-faire free market approaches and both were the last people to you know, even accept that there's a pandemic going on and then often take steps to kind of, you know, disband the international global health service system. So Britain was constantly, you know, fighting with France, Germany, who were imposing for quarantines back then and saying, no, we, we, we need the wheels of commerce running. And last year, you saw what Donald Trump did. He pulled out of WHO, you know, uh, momentarily. Uh, 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 he, he basically for a long time resisted the idea that the pandemic was. So that's what's very interesting because the more you are on this sort of laissez-faire free market end, and if you are the global you know, economic power, there's a huge tendency to underplay the seed. And that's a strong similarity that I see between the 19th century um, and now. Then, you know, what Thomas said about the outside. I think that's, you know, very important point that this constant need outside in two senses. One is at the individual level to blame someone outside. And this could be for India as a whole, the Chinese, but even at the more basic, we saw this case of the Tablighi Jamaat, you know, last year saying it was one super spreader event and the, the media went uh, gaga over that. Uh, but, you know, people back then, 100 years back, were also talking about, it could be based on caste. Ambedkar pointed out, for example, that cholera, when it came to a village, people would often blame particular, you know, caste members and often, you know, in, in some cases, literally beat them up or in, in some cases, burn them. But so these ideas that, there's an outsider, there's someone you need to blame is I think a strong commonality, which we're seeing. It's a kind of human response, I think, coming to these pandemics. And I think that's something that can, with you know, adequate sensitization, can be actually used. The other othering, I think, happens in the government response, not the individual response. And that's that we, all, we are looking for comparing our performance with the worst benchmark possible, right? And so India, for example, last year, we were always, if you see read the economic survey of India, you know, they have this chart where India is shown as the best performer with respect to US, Germany, you know, UK and so on. But actually the fact is if you see 200 countries of the world, India is ranked between say 100 and 120. So we're not even above the median country in the world in terms of how we did during the first wave, forget, you know, the second wave. And again, this strong sense, even back then, when I see the documents of the British, always comparing yourself with the worst performer. Right? So this is again a strong commonality that your benchmark is a very non-scientific benchmark. It just, you have to find, so this othering or finding an outsider is at the individual level, but also outside the government level, saying, see, look, these guys are doing much worse than us. We've taken steps and, you know, things could have been much worse. So that's also, you know, one aspect. But finally, I'll talk about migration, you know, because that's something which I've been working on for the past 10 years. And again, there I see the similarity uh, between that time and now. That is this obvious need for migrant workers, especially internal migrants to go back home. You know, the fact that in India in particular, circular migration is so high, people have one leg in the village, one leg in the city. And so when the pandemic comes, there are two reasons. One is, of course, that, you know, you're losing your job, so you want to go back home. But I believe there's also a larger cultural reason. That is, people have this idea that if you're anyway going to die, you might as well die in the village. There's a very strong attachment to that. And so just since you mentioned similarity, you know, one of my aha moments when I was doing research for this book was to literally find the same sentences which are being used today back then. And one of them was on the railway station in Bombay when they said, you know, agar marna hai, to gaon mein marenge, which is exactly what, you know, we were hearing last year during this whole migration crisis. So I think there, you know, these, these pandemic responses, uh, you see a pattern. And in, in the book, I kind of end the book with this, this characterization of based on Indian data for these three pandemics in India, that there are four stages of a pandemic. Right? And they are basically, it starts with denial. It goes on to confusion then acceptance, and then erasure. 
Now, when I was writing the book, I was talking about erasure, internal erasure of memory, you know, between 1918 and 2020 in India, where we had completely forgotten the pandemic. I did not know we would forget so soon, you know, between the book when it came out in November, December, and March, you know, in four or five months, we went kind of celebrating the so-called end game of the pandemic, as, you know, health ministers reportedly said. Uh, and so that's, uh, so I just end by saying that the, the key similarity between the pandemics under the British and now or rather the takeaway is that you never celebrate the end of a pandemic. You know, let it just die out on its own natural way. Please do not boast success. You don't really know how much of that success is aspirated. And so the British, you know, started celebrating. The pandemics kept coming, you know, uh, ripping through the subcontinent. And so that's, I think, a key takeaway. And a key similarity, again, that is premature celebration of the end of a pandemic. So pandemics don't typically get over in a month. Or, you know, it takes some time. Okay, uh, thanks. Uh, yeah, there's a common belief that uh, we learn from history or we learn from our past experiences. Uh, you know, to some extent, in fact, a large extent, perhaps, this is an overrated idea that we learn from history and from past experiences. And our experience as of now during the second wave of pandemic or beginning from you know the period in between the first and the second wave shows that we did not uh, pay heed to what happened in the past uh, based on past studies on pandemics, past experiences with pandemics. Now, this applies uh, not just to policymakers, but of course to mm. No, not learning from the past. Now, in dealing with the current pandemic, does it show, or to what extent does it even show that we bothered to learn anything from the past? Uh, you know, not not just from what happened 100 years ago or 20, mm -hmm. the case of SARS, uh, but also from what happened last year, you know, during the first wave of the pandemic. Did we, at, 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 and this is not just, I'm not saying that the government should have learned this. I'm saying, did the common people even, was it even communicated to common people, to ordinary people, uh, that, you know, watch out, be careful. Uh, this is not the end of it. And Chinmay, you you uh, talked about it a little bit, but uh, let me come back to you. Uh, do we have any indication uh, at any level of, <laughs> whether at the government level, whether at the level of civil society organizations or individuals, that we have learned anything from the past? Yeah, should, should I speak? I'll just say, yeah. Yes, yes, yes. yes. Yeah. I mean, you know, there are always some individuals, some policymakers who have been very alert. Of course, what you're seeing today, the mess, is of course because the bulk did not. But, but I would like to harp on the success that let at least there are clear examples of some things learned from history. For example, one thing, you know, clear thing that the government is really scared to do right now is that national lockdown, right? Which the pressure is really building up right now. But while they praised it themselves last year, they know the economic devastation it caused especially for migrant workers. And I've argued that the migrant crisis was precise, was primarily more than the lockdown was because they shut down the railways. Right? And so they have not shut down the railways. And that's, I think, a learning from this year, from last year. That is, if you shut down the Indian railways, you're going to get more, you know, more crisis. Kind of so that's, I think, a learning that the government, and you can see they're really scared. You know, they're not, they're using this thing of the lockdown as a last measure. So, so that's, I think, a learning from uh, last year. Uh, there have been, you know, there is a, a, a the district magistrate of Nandurbar district, Dr. Rajendra Bharud. He, in September, he learned from what is happening around the world. He saw what is happening in US and Brazil, and he set up an oxygen plant. Right now, this is these are kind of success stories which I think we need to share because there is always the case that a few people are learning from past recent mm -hmm. events. And you know more power to such policymakers who are really truly visionary. And so clearly, I mean, if you're building a, if you're, when everyone is shutting down their COVID care hospitals, when everyone is scaling down, almost saying it's the, it's over. You know, a few policymakers step up and say, no, we need to. This is the time now to ramp up, right? I mean, this is really the mentality that we should have had. That this is the time we need to do X, Y, Z. Suppose the peak surges happen. You know, what is the capacity we need as well? So clearly some people did it, but it was just too tiny, right? And we are seeing, I think uh, Mumbai, for example, you know, this chase the patient policy, which they, I think, developed last year has stood them in great stead. So there was clearly learning from that first wave when cases, because what we know is in a raging pandemic, 
there is actually very little the government can do in particular because the hospital system gets overburdened and the first stage is that a lot of people go to the hospital but they should not be going to the hospital i mean it's a very mild case and that's how the panic kind of builds and i think what the mumbai kind of authorities learned is that if you go to the patients and instead of the patient chasing the doctor you know that kind of uh, so that's a, i think there are there are strong learning what we need to do is really you know, have like a standard operating procedure now based on what's happened saying that look if you shut down the railways there are pros and cons but the cons seem to be very hard right you get these migrants walking back home thousand kilometers so i think you know we did not really have a draft report a standing committee kind of report you know coming out with what has been learned in that first year which could have you know a uh, uh, health stead uh, uh, now and i think when i look at the british you know records one of the thing that strikes me is for all their faults you know they had an excellent documentation system right as some people have joked is that we know how cruel the british were precisely because they maintained statistics and you know <laughs> and then the data today unfortunately i mean i'll tell you we had more timely all cause mortality statistics in 1918 19 than we have today can you beat that after 100 years i mean of course we have data on cases and other things which they didn't have back then but we still don't know we don't know the scale of under reporting which is happening now for example in terms of deaths and so on so there have been a few people who have learned from you know history and what's happening in other places uh but by and large uh, now and that i should say i should, that's why i wrote this book is to basically chronicle at least you know what happened at a particular time yeah thomas you can add that let me sort of yeah and you know move, moving moving to uh, can you hear me is the sound okay yeah 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 okay so moving moving slightly uh, closer to the last decade um i think the hopeful thing is that we have examples both internationally and within the country of governmental systems that have learned from this and individuals so i think we need to know who is learning i mean all of us have taken it but the question is in terms of the society what we are learning but before that let me point out you know the the um countries that have done best in handling um this current pandemic that is china japan korea singapore hong kong southeast asia were the countries that were hit by sars in 2003 and many of these countries uh, japan korea china particularly said never 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 again are we going to mess up like this right korea after they had an outbreak of mers which came as a big shock to them they once more said that never as a country are we ever going to mess up like this similarly singapore um after 2003 hong kong and so there are societies that experience similar events and also at both at the societal level and at the level of governance decided that this is unacceptable this is never ever going to happen to our people again set up within india we keep talking about kerala and why did kerala do well because they had the experience of nepa right which of course also begs the question <clears throat> why did kerala do well in handling nepa and and learn which i mean and which so it's a little bit more complex I and mean, we can push this question a little bit further down but the point is there is learning um even more recently after the 2009 swine flu pandemic which actually was the la which was the most recent real pandemic in the sense of a new virus that is traveled globally and is simultaneously um you know infecting different parts of the globe um even in india h1n1 was when you had pandemic plans put into action at least formulated if not put into action and a lot of it was help from the who global you know that every country needs to have a pandemic plan a lot of procedures were put in uh, who is supposed to do what um and a lot of it so i was looking at these because one of the things i'm i'm working on on how you know how the world has responded to uh, covid-19 so one of the things i've been doing is really looking at the 2019 the 2009 influenza pandemic plans that the government made um and comparing it with what we are doing now 
And there is similarity. I mean, if you look at all the orders that are coming from the government in terms of chains of command, in terms of SOPs, because we're very good at, you know, from the centralized sort of putting out these SOPs and so on. Um, all of them actually are very, were really based or very similar to what is in what was devised in 2009, 2010 in the context of the H1N1 uh, pandemic. So we do have this on, on paper. Uh, what we don't have is any kind of institutional memory and especially in the form of the way our administrative system and our political systems work, there is pretty rapid turnover, right? So the people who are, who are dealing with uh, the pandemic now, both um, in the administration as well in the political level, probably won't be around when the next one comes, right? And everything that is learned is, 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 is going to be forgotten. And it's really fortunate that Chinmay, you've at least put together something right now of what happened over a hundred years ago, because um, otherwise we wouldn't even really have that. So the question really, I think, is what do we, as not as individuals, but as a society, what are our learnings from this? What are we, as a society, going to do when something similar comes, regardless of what the government is doing? What kind of precautions are we going to take? Everybody, East Asia people automatically mask up. And this is something which actually probably goes back to the 1918 pandemic. Um, so in Hong Kong, where I lived for many years, I mean, even a student with a cold, suddenly, and this really struck me as bizarre initially, because you'd be walking, you know, you'd be walking in the university and suddenly you'll see a student with a surgical mask. And you'll wonder what happened, it must be really sick. And you see the same student in class, and you go, what happened? No, no, I just got a cold. But this is, and it's almost part of it. This is an automatic thing that people do uh, when you have a cold or when you have any kind of respiratory ailment, the first thing you do is that you put on a mask uh, to protect others, right? And these are learnings, of course, that have, don't happen overnight, but are now deeply ingrained. So I think the real question, and this is something is worth, and, uh, I mean, one of the many questions really is, what are the kind of societal learnings, behavior changes, um, changes in the way we look at the world, changes in the way we look at health and who is responsible for our health. I mean, given the fact that you know, if you, you can see what's happening in terms of vaccination and so on, um, who, who, who are we responsible? Are they, and, or in, even at the level of governments, is the state uh, governance, is the state responsible? Is the central government responsible? Am I responsible for my family? Um, are we responsible for, you know, um, all our friends, is that how we're going to reorganize ourselves? Because clearly at the governmental level, something is not working. When we, when we are gasping for breath, um, clearly something is not happening. So I think this is, to me, this is really interesting. What is the kind of society, both national as well as global society, that is going to emerge from the immense destruction the immense sort of the tearing of our societal fabric, both globally as well as nationally, that uh, this virus has achieved, how are we going to repair all of this together? Uh, put all of this back together? And what is this new world going to look like? I mean, as an optimist, one must always hope that it will be a lot, lot better. Um, uh, let me leave it at that. Uh, thank you, Thomas. Uh my next question, again, uh, is a sort of a follow-up question. And again, uh, I think Chinmay, and your, uh, you had a series of tweets recently on the subject, and you already mentioned it a little bit uh, about uh, the, the reliability of data. Uh, because, uh, again, <laughs> I'm sorry I have to use the word learning again, but uh, what we learn from the past or from the recent past or from history depends much on you know how well we collected the data, how easy or difficult it was at that time to, to collect data. And I'll quote a sentence or two from each of your books. Uh, you know, Thomas, in your book on SARS, and this is, uh, you know, we'll come back to China also, uh, you, you end the chapter like this. The lesson that a free flow of information can help prevent the spread of disease had not yet been learned. 
Now, this is a question which uh, you can answer with respect to China at this time. I mean, uh, China in 2019, end of 2019, 20, when they again tried to suppress uh, that information. Uh, but also from Chinma's book, uh, you know, uh, you, you write, the remembrance of past pandemics also means that we should carefully document the ongoing one so that the mistakes we make today are not repeated in the future. Now, clearly we are, at least India, uh, is clearly falling short uh, on that. And despite the fact that we are not China, uh, you know, <laughs> one, one would like to believe that, you know, these are the kinds of things that happen in authoritarian societies which uh, are uh, determined to control the narrative, uh, to control the story. Uh, but it seems that this is happening in a society which is open, democratic. You had elections as recently as now. And still, uh, you know, the kind of information we are getting, we know there is serious uh, underreporting, but we, we are left to guess by how much. And so five years down the line, 10 years down the line, or 50 years down the line, when we have uh, the next big pandemic, uh, when we look back at what happened in 2020, 21, or 22, uh, we won't have that kind of reliable information, right? How is that going to be a problem? Or how is that uh, a problem even now? You know, while we come up with our vaccination strategy, for example, or, you know, what to do in the next few months if we do not have uh, reliable numbers in front of us? Chinmay first and then Thomas. Yeah, I mean, you know, Data is critical for the simple reason that, you know, first you need, when a pandemic strikes, first you need to understand what is striking you. Remember 1918, they didn't really know what, they thought it was bacteria at that time. You know, it took about 80 years for people to understand what hit them actually. You need to understand transmission. Uh, you need to then finally understand cure. Uh, so these are the kind of three classic things. Uh, now, you know, if if you see what's, what's the, the criticality of data, uh, one is a simple thing what the US puts out as all cause mortality. So the thing is, we don't, people start dying of you know, uh, the disease, the pandemic disease, but people start dying also because of other, other kind of uh, things they've denied medical access because of uh, you know, uh, hospitals being full and so on. So overall death rates kind of tend to kind of increase. And so we, you know, I mean, just think of cholera. You know, cholera for the longest time was thought to be an airborne disease. It is only with data that a guy called John Snow figured it out that you know this is a waterborne uh, disease. It's a different matter that Indian officials, you know, British officials in India ignored John Snow for the next 40 years. But the fact is that we to, cholera today is no longer a dangerous disease because of data. You know, it's it's nothing else. At the end of the day, ending plague was about understanding how plague worked, and that was through systematic experiments, systematic collection of data. And that data is one at an experimental level, that is clinical trials, you know, to assess the degree of accuracy of, say, vaccines or medicines. But at a larger level, the basic idea, that is how many people are sick and how many people die of the disease, right? This is very, very critical. And the more you kind of uh, uh, try and, I think the thing with India is, of course, the onus of collecting these, data, these statistics is at the state level. And so you get a lot of state level variation. And so you can say that some states are better at the coverage of these statistics are better than others and so on. Uh, but it's very important to get you know good data because you can end a pandemic only if you have data. Otherwise, you're just flying blind. You don't know when to your, put your restrictions. You don't know when to take out your restrictions. You know all sorts of things. The data also now we realize is you know in what we goofed up spectacularly was not understanding the the variants of the virus. So we need good data on 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 uh, you know, good monitoring of which are the viruses floating around in the population. What are the properties of those? So data at multiple levels, you know, uh, has to be there. Uh, I, for one, have been tracking now something called Google Mobility data just to try and understand you know, how people are uh, reducing their mobility levels because that is an important part of the pandemic. So yes, you know, uh, it's it's a very critical part of the story. Uh, we need to strengthen our data systems. You know, I, again, I come from economics. In economics. You know, from 1950 onwards, India has a very proud, I mean, India can be proud of its tradition of economic statistics system. You know, guys like Mal Nobis built the National Sample Survey. This was emulated by countries across the world. So we also have a tradition of having good, you know, if we, if we put our mind to it, we can get good statistics. Uh, but it, what, what happens is that, of course, pandemic or any crisis event is also about politics. 
right? And so you're going to get governments going to try and uh, uh, massage the statistics. Eventually, just say, okay, just don't show the test results, just don't show the cases, just don't show the deaths. Uh, and that's why we need independent researchers, journalists to really, you know, show the thing. I'll just end by pointing out, you know, why does this, as as this famous, you know, line says, uh, a single death is a tragedy and a million is a statistic. So why should statistics matter? Often you don't get accountability if you don't have the right statistics. And I'll again point out here with the 1918 influenza, the reigning number at that point was 6 million deaths. Now 6 million is a lot, 60 lakh deaths. But 6 million was a number which was thrown up by the famines of those years. Right? So it was not in the collective memory of that generation. It was not really seen as in something out of the blue. We now know using different methods that actually about 20 million people died. Those are my estimates, but other people have put it 15 to 20 million. That's about three times more than the famines of those times. And if people actually saw what had happened, and if they knew that some of this was just because the you know, authorities could not get food on time, just like they're not getting oxygen on time in many places, the accountability level would have been much more. You know, we have said that, look, this is the greatest demographic disaster. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that by the end of this, if you're going at 3,000 reported deaths a day, for a month, you're getting about 100,000 just reported deaths within a month or two. That is probably India's greatest demographic disaster in post-independence. So people need to put it out that way. You know, that, that, and that is why statistics matter, so that we commit to ourselves that, like you know, Thomas very nicely said, that this can never happen again. What many countries in East Asia are saying, that this should never happen. And for that, we need data. Um, yeah, thanks, that's wonderful. Um, I'm, I'm just going to, uh, let me build a little on, on the platform uh, that uh, Chinmay has, uh, in a sense, uh, or the uh, things that he has already said, and, but I'll just elaborate on them. But before that, I'll just spend a minute or so really talking about the difference between China in 2003 and, the Ch and China in 2020 in terms of the way they responded to SARS. Um, China, in 2003, the original SARS, China was a complete disaster. So for three months, they hit the fact that they had this new disease that they knew nothing about. Um, they didn't tell the world. They didn't tell their own people. Now, clearly, their people knew what was happening. They could see people dying. Uh, their friends who were doctors and nurses were saying, this is the worst thing we've ever seen. But they, there was this huge cover-up because that was the only way that the system knew how to respond to bad news. Right. And the system, uh, I don't know why I'm using this awful term system, which is becoming current here. This is the only way that the Chinese Communist Party and the Chinese government knew how to respond to this. Um, and the Communist Party is a one party state. There was a transition of power from one generation of leaders to another happening um, around the same time, a few months after SARS. So if the whole thing was to say everything is normal and to, 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 to use a phrase which um, we find very often in, in anything reported statements by our, our, our bureaucrats and our leaders, no need to panic, right? which seems to be uh, the sort of the, 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 the motto um, that we, uh, many of us that is followed. Um, so it was a disaster. And it was only when the disease came to Hong Kong about two months later, and the first cases came uh, appeared in Hong Kong. Uh, and from Hong Kong, because it's so globalized, it spread within a week to various other parts of the world. Um, and it is only then that doctors, scientists, and this is not to say Chinese doctors were, had, knew nothing about it. They did a lot of work, but it was all hidden. So the wheel had to be reinvented. And anyway, the, to cut the long story short, the, epi, the SARS ruined China's global reputation so badly, and the Chinese ambition <clears throat> to become a leading global power within the space of two generations at the most, so badly that they knew they had to do things differently. They had to do things the way the rest of the world did it. And at least in matters of, 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 of disease and global spread of disease, they had to be much more transparent. The other change, of course, in China um, <clears throat> is that with a growing, growing middle class, everybody's on social media, people are extremely well educated, they are articulate, you cannot hide things anymore. So these were the two things that changed. 
So by the time 2020 came, the response was not perfect uh, because the, uh, there were provincial level hospitals and scientists who had actually sequenced the virus and said this is a coronavirus. But the central government, which controls everything, said, no, 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 you can't release this yet. We need to confirm this. So that took maybe another week, two weeks. But at the end of the day, a disease that had appeared about in middle of January and started creating a serious concern by the end of this, sorry, middle of December and had started creating concern by the end of December. By January 11th, it had been identified as a new coronavirus. And most important of all, its genetic sequence had been shared globally. This allowed the entire world to develop test kits, to have, you know, to study the virus. And this is how our vac the vaccines were available so quickly. Because some people from middle of January onwards, they saw this new virus and said, hey, let's see whether we can, let's try and, you know, at least build a prototype vaccine. It may come to nothing, but let's do it. And we have the gene sequence here. Um, and so China was not perfect, but as far as the rest of the world was concerned, they behaved in an exemplary manner. In terms of their own people, I think they hit things. So they, there's that disjunction. Um, so in India, we're a long way from this because transparency and here I'm talking really I mean, you 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 you've set out the big picture very well uh, Chinme but in terms of the communication in the in terms of even statistics who actually owns statistics in a democracy whose figures are these does it belong to the government or some private organization no I mean the, this belongs to everybody I and mean, this belongs to the people right it is their data um, but the emphasis really, and this whole the government actually, the, the whole response had been working in silos, right? So data really has become this precious resource because I suspect data means power as well, right? So if you look at the way um, RT-PCR tests are done, I'm in Bangalore, right? I go to a testing center, that has, the test is done, those results need to go to the ICMR, and until recently, the test center could not tell me until it was for the ICMR would inform BBMP, that is the municipal corporation, and they would come and tell me saying you are pos positive, right? So you had no ownership of data. Um, that has changed, of course. Now you get the results, you know, by the evening, they, everybody tells you what your result is. You, that had changed, but now we've gone back because of the la vast sort of uh, the numbers of people who are, who, are, who, who, who are getting tested. So there's that whole question of even something like vaccines, right? The mismatch between demand and supply. That is something that everybody should know. Right, um, and but nobody talks about it. Though it is obvious. I mean, the vaccine manufacturers were saying this that you know we can't make enough. Um, the government was saying there's no shortage of vaccine. Um, what were people to believe? Right, and so and this really goes back to we're still a state. I mean, the, our structures of governance are still rooted in the colonial experience, right? Uh, both formally in terms of the system of, you know, your district collector, your district magistrate, you know, the whole machinery is geared towards raising land revenue and maintaining law and order, right? Um, and that really, and development now has been added on, but these are still, our structures are really designed to do these two things. So the question then is, we don't have a wider, we don't have the institutions, the structures, the, 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 the kind of democracy whereby the sharing of data is the default mode, not something exceptional, right? 
Um, even the big blow, I mean, the huge uh, leap forward was the RTI, the, uh, you know, the right to information. But even that has now been completely, uh, and we're going back to the old sort of colonial, the early Indian mode, post-colonial as well, even after independence of, you know, we are the government, this is our data, and we will tell you what we think you should know, or we will tell you what we want you to know, right? Whether it's true, whether it's false. Um, and in the year, in the 21st century, in the second decade of the 21st century, it is not possible to govern a country like this. China found this out in 2003, and I think this is a lesson that will be learned here as well. Um, so we need much more transparency, we need much more sharing of data, and we've got excellent, we've probably got the best epidemiologists, we've got the best statisticians, we've got world-class people but they don't have access to the data, right? And, and there was a, um, a lot, um, many researchers have now written, they wrote to the government uh, saying, please, dear ICMR, please give us this data. I mean, we, we have no shortage of, 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 of skilled manpower to use, uh, if, you, if you will. Um, but they don't have access to the data. And why is because we still work in this sort of very, uh, you know, the key word in our governance is eligibility. Who is eligible for what? I think this is probably the most important word in, in our country. What am I eligible for, right? Am I eligible to know my test result? Am I eligible to be vac vaccinated now? Am I eligible to travel, right? And, and so we wait to know what our eligibility is. Um, but that is not the way to fight major societal challenges such as a pandemic in this day and age. Just quickly, you know, point out, since I work on migration, the census 2011 data on migration was released in 2018. And when it came out, there were some mistakes. So now even the, those files are gone. So 2011 data, you know, released 10 years later almost. Uh, it's, it's, just, it's just crazy. Anyway, yeah. Uh, Thomas, uh, I think, uh, can we go to about uh, 5.45 if uh, we are both free? Sure. Uh, I have a... I have a couple of questions and they are, I think, uh, interesting enough uh, for you to uh, answer. Uh, now, the way I see it, and you know, all of us are in different ways, uh, uh, people who sit in an armchair and you know, say a lot of things. Mm. Uh, but that's how it is. Uh, so the question is this, it's easy to look back at 2020. Uh, and criticize uh, the decisions that were taken then, uh, or even look at what's been happening the last two or three months and say, well, these are the things that the government should have been doing and these are the things they should not have been doing. Uh, but it seems to me, and you know, from my understanding of the way the pandemic has played out in India, is that uh, one can identify two critical periods uh, probably February, March, 2020, uh, when February, when we started getting some information and March, when uh, we were trying to figure out what to do. Uh, and again, uh, you know, the period February, March in 2021, when you had the Kumbh Mela, when you had elections, when you had, you know, uh, when the first wave was gone and we were talking about, you know, how we have immunity and uh, all those wonderful things about how the pandemic has ended. Now, during these two critical periods, critical junctures, if you will, what are those two or three different things? And I, I qualified my question immediately. I said, look, you know, <laughs> we are all sitting in our armchairs and we are going to pass judgment on this. But still keeping that in mind, what are the two or three things that could have been done differently in 2020 and in 2021? Because these are the two periods when what we did or did not do had has had immense, you know, enormous consequences. Um, Thomas first. Okay. Um, thank you. So uh, going um, in 2020, and I wrote about this then at that time, all we needed to do, we should really have looked to see at what, looked at what was happening in Wuhan, the rapidity of the spread, right? The symptoms it was causing, 
right? And we should have known, and I think, and this is the whole point. Um, once more in Kerala, I think the health minister at that time, or the, the her staff at that time looked at this and said, this is terrible. What do we do if it comes here? You know, China was, it really, in a sense, it told the world how terrible this virus is. It is easily transmittable. It's, you know, there are large numbers of asymptomatic infections. Um, the mortality rate is not that high, but it sickens a lot of people. And if, you know, if, if large numbers of people are falling ill, and but you still say only maybe 10% need hospitalization. 10% of a large number is a very large number. So in Wuhan, they were building emergency hospitals. They were thinking about all the things that we are seeing now, right? Um, where do we get oxygen from? How do we triage patients? What do we do with mild patients? How, what do we do? What are the clinical things? All of this was being played out in real time in front of the world. But I think most of the world, um, and, and it is not just India, but everywhere looked at it as, wow, see what's happening in China. And as this another sort of, you know, this strange thing that's happening in China, right? Um, and assume this would not happen anywhere else. So that's what we should have done. 2020 by February, we knew how terrible this was. We knew it was a globally transmitting as well, because by the end of January, it was already in about 10 different countries. And we had the first cases, easily transmissible, rapidly transmissible, large number of asymptomatic uh, um, uh, transmitters, um, and so difficult to control. All of this was already there. And so, and I wrote this at that time saying the question really is, what do we do if it reaches India, right? Um, in terms of ICU beds, in terms of oxygen, in terms of, you know, how do we prepare for the worst? Because when it comes to nature, I think whether it, these are cyclones, whether these are tsunamis, or whether these are viral onslaughts, it is always better to prepare for the worst. So that is one thing that I would say. In terms, uh, fast forward to a year later, you already had pretty strong data uh, from Maharashtra, uh, starting from January, February, saying that this is transmitting something is happening, it's transmitting again, right? There are small differences, of course. It not, um, it's, different, it's a different group of people, uh, different geographies within the state, um, and the areas and the people that were hit worst in the first wave are probably not being hit, and hit that badly now, but there's something going on. This thing is on the march once more. At the same time, you had sequencing data, not merely from India, but the experience globally. And this is one big change. I mean, in terms of science, I think the one big strength that we have today is that there is a global scientific establishment working both on anything to do with the virus, on vaccines, and so on. So we don't really need to, you know, work in our little isolated compartments anymore. And sharing, sharing, I think, is going to be extremely, extremely important if our species is going to survive, uh, you know, the, the next onslaught. So coming back, you had, you had information about um, the second wave beginning. And at that time, the narrative was, oh, this is Maharashtra, they're messing up, right? And there were reasons for this narrative as well. You had information about the new variants you knew that an increasing number of cases that were being sequenced were of this new variant, but you didn't know whether it was more serious. You didn't, in a sense, know, even know if it was more transmissible. It could just be that this is the first, you know, this, this virus is reaching places where old, older variants were not there, right? And so you will get a lot more of this. So it could be for any number of reasons. But um, you also had the warning that every major country in the world, bar China, has gone through at least three waves. So there is no reason, there was no reason to expect that there was some form of exceptionalism at work, which meant that we would not go to subsequent waves without doing anything. I mean, clearly, if you do, if you actively intervene, you can stop future waves. But by not doing anything and then expecting a new wave is not going to happen, I, it, it, it is very short-sighted, to say the least. And so these were things that 
even I, and I'm not an epidemiologist, um, epidemiologist um, saw and wrote about both last January as well as earlier this year. So it, clearly, if I can see this, there were uh, there are far people who are far more equipped, far smarter than me in this country. I mean, professional, um, you know, who, who really know their stuff, um, who also saw this, and I'm sure within government as well. I mean, within the ICMR, within the INSACOG, the group of these are all governmental institutions, by the way, who are doing the gene sequencing. So all of this was there was, you know, people saw what was happening. They were not happy with what was happening. But clearly, there was a gap, I think, between um, the scientific evidence, uh, maybe, and the kind of advice that was going up to the prime minister's office and whoever else was, you know, um, in charge. Um, there probably was a gap. Maybe it didn't go up at all. Maybe it wasn't listened to. That we know, don't know. Probably will never know. But I think these were some of the things. I mean, the warning signs were always there, um, and but they were ignored. Yeah, I think it's a very you know good question because it obviously forces armchair intellectuals to think of you know if I was the prime minister of India what would mm -hmm. I have done, mm -hmm. and it's I think very important for people to do that. Uh, so if I was the prime minister of India, uh, I would first give a press conference, right? I think it's very important <laughs> to basically give. No, I'm, 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 and I'm saying this not just in jest because if you see state level good performance so far, you know. Uh, you look at the Kerala government, you look at the Maharashtra government over the last month or two, there's been clear, consistent public communication in a feedback mode. Right? So it's not like a speech mode, but you know, the chief minister of these states, they're taking questions. I think that's very useful because you get nasty questions and that forces you to think because you, if you're surrounded by bureaucrats who are not going to speak up, then there's no way you're going to get you know, uh, pointed questions asked at you. So that's, that's very important, I think, uh, you know, in, in crisis mode. But more seriously, you know, uh, in terms of the timing of the lockdown last year, you'd see that virtually every country in the world went for a lockdown between those 10 days, 20th March and 30th March. So if you look at the mobility scores, I've looked at these scores for you know, more than 150 countries or 100 plus countries, and they all go down pretty much the same. Right? So virtually every country did the same thing. Right? And I think on, on you know, I, I was saying that at that time as well, that this is a good thing, but shutting down the Indian railways was a big mistake mm -hmm. uh, for simple and you know I wrote an open piece in Hindustan Times in uh, uh, March uh, at that point saying that you know let the workers go home because it made the most sense for workers to go home at a stage where the infection rates were low rather than sending them back later on which we eventually did in the month of May we had shramic trains sending back people when the infection rates were much higher so that was just in terms of uh, and that probably comes from my bias because I have been working on migration in the past and yes, the other thing would be that when you're going for a lockdown, you need fiscal support. You need a uh, massive fiscal expansion, which you know countries in the West and all have gone for eight to twelve percent of GDP kind of level of fiscal expansion. Our numbers, if you look at the actual numbers, they're less than two percent. Right. So basically, restrictions with relief, I think, is really a, a core part of any pandemic management. And so that's that's what would have happened. Now, even after doing all that, there's no guarantee you will still have some deaths, unfortunately, in a pandemic. And so, you know, uh, being a policymaker in to ma trying to manage a pandemic is hard stuff. You're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. That's that's a hard reality. Uh, but definitely, you know, I think with the knowledge of history, if I was a prime minister of India, I would never celebrate the end of a pandemic. You know, even after this wave now, suppose it peaks in mid-May, you know, just, <laughs> just, it just never claim confidently at a global stage that you know this is the end and also trout about our great you know model of how we defeated this pandemic and so on uh, we should also actually not gloat about others miseries you know i think there was some sort of a shot of freud which happened last year where this almost i'm not i'm not saying as a policymaker but as a society you're saying that these americans they, they're not as tough as us you know this again this immunity natural immunity logic it's precisely because they've not had in you know, a pani puri on the streets that you know they don't. Mm -hmm. It's some absolutely crazy unscientific logic you know, which took root. Uh, and, and kind of a, as I said, you know, this pleasure at other person's misery, saying that, and it was also something like you know because the data makes it clear in 2020, the richer the country, the more the suffering, right? So it kind of went against all the standard notions of development and public health all the expectations whether the poor countries do badly. So I think in India as well, you know, there's this idea that 
we have something to offer to the world in how we have managed. And I think that that is kind of hubris, uh, which I think there were a lot of pointers all along uh, because there were health systems stretched even in mid-September when the first uh, uh, peak. And obviously, you know, now one can argue about how much, you know, what's going to, I think what's going to happen in two months down the line, suppose this wave stabilizes this month, the defense of the mess right now that we face in is that there's no way anybody could have anticipated it, right? And people are going to point out to other countries and say, look, this is exponential. The first wave was so flat, the second wave, even if we had ramped up health facilities, nothing could have been done. And I think that's a faulty logic. Uh, because we have experiences from the past, from other countries last year about exponential rises. Uh, I've shown graphs, you know, Siddharth Chandra's work on influenza 1918 shows these graphs for 1918, the first mild wave and the second wave, as people say, flattening the curve on the y-axis, not the x-axis. You know, you can have exponential. And so any planning scenario you know, has to have these things. If it rises by two times, three times, 10 times, 20 times, what is the capacity we need? And yes, as I said, you know, you will get some excess mortality in any pandemic, unfortunately, uh, unless you're completely shutting yourself, like say New Zealand and you know, uh, Australia, something like that. Uh, but, uh, but I do think you know, we should not have boasted uh, because there are a lot of things in pandemic management which is beyond your own actions. You know, uh, and ultimately, uh, you know, like I, I keep giving this example of the plague. Uh, when, when plague struck you know, India in 1896, uh, over the next 10 years, it kept hitting, you know, Western India, Northern India. And the municipal commissioners in Calcutta and Madras kept saying stuff like, you know, we're doing a great job with plague. Now, it turns out later when they figured out transmission, that, you know, it was about a particular kind of a rat and a particular kind of flea, which were not efficient transmitters of plague in Chennai and, and, uh, and Madras and Calcutta. So it had very little to do with mm -hmm. policy. It was just luck, so to speak, or in a sense, the disease ecology which kind of hit certain places more than others. And so five years down the line, we're going to learn about why US, Germany, you know, were more hit in the first wave than us, or why we are being, you know, battled right now than others. Uh, and so we should not over speculate on regional variations in, you know, case, case incidents of mortality. Uh, and so I think that's the broad you know, way I think policymakers, I mean, to just build onto your question, what should be the learning from this wave? You know, one was a 2020 to 21, but what is the learning now? is first, don't celebrate the end of the pandemic. You know, the first priority right now is to vaccinate as many people uh, and literally convey the sense that, you know, 20 to 21 is a kind of a washout here, right? That is still the, everyone is vaccinated. Everyone meaning critical mass is vaccinated. We can't afford to let our guard down again. And in that time period, we need to have an oxygen plant in every district of India for the next five months are going to be critical. So there's, so there's also going to be important learning for the next wave uh, that comes. One one very small last question, and uh, which is that uh, when we look at what has been going on since the last 12, 18, 12 months, you know, in, in, in when you read the newspaper or you know look at social media, you know what people are saying, you get a sense that there's a lot of focus on. Uh, the kinds of wrong policies, you know, things that are done or not done by the government, whether it's the central government or, or the state government. Uh, it's also about, you know, uh, individual and collective behavior. So, for example, this morning, uh, I saw a video of a religious procession in Ahmedabad. Uh, Chinmay, are you in Ahmedabad right now? Or in yeah. Ahmedabad? yeah. Okay. So, uh, you know, a religious procession in, in Ahmedabad, and obviously that will be a, what they call a super spreader event and all that. But moving back, uh, I don't think many people are giving uh, sufficient emphasis to the fact that we have inherited a very fragile, uh, nearly broken public health system. I'm not saying that you know in European countries where they have more robust health systems, they uh, were always they have always been able to deal with COVID last year or this year much better. Uh, than we would, I mean, we would have expected them to deal with it better. You know? But you know, hospitals were overflowing everywhere. Uh, so a pandemic, of course, by definition is going to cause these kinds of problems. But what I think is missing in the current uh, storyline is uh, the fact that uh, when something like a pandemic hits us, given the fragile, broken nature of our public health system, the most 
privatized in the world. I mean, right now, it's remarkable, is it not, that Twitter uh, is doing more, uh, is successful in terms of arranging for oxygen than any branch of government, any body, any organization, anyway. It's a remarkable story. Uh, but that's, that's not about how useful Twitter is. I think that is a reflection of how badly broken the public health system is, how there is no government organization which can coordinate effectively these efforts at saving lives. Is it not? Would you agree with that, that we are not uh, talking enough about our public health system? Um, I'll go back actually to, obviously, the big picture I, at a global, at a national level, um, your statement is absolutely correct. I and mean, this is decades, centuries of, uh, well, several hundred years of underinvestment in a public health system. I think it's, lots of people don't even know the difference between public health and clinical medicine which is why on television channels, I mean, you have clinical doctors talking about viruses and epidemiology. And, and that is a reflection of the fact that public health, people understand it really as public health services, going to the government or going private, right? You go to government, that's public. But the concept of public health as the science of ensuring population level health and ensure and, and understanding the determinants of disease within a population that is not there, which is different from clinical medicine. Um, and so both in terms of investment, both in terms of understanding what public health is, clearly there's a lot of, 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 of there's a long way to go. It is broken. On the other hand, there's so many good examples of good district administrators. Chinmaya gave one. Um, my home district in Kerala had an excellent collector. He's transferred now. I'm sure the new person is as good. These are young, dynamic people who want to get things done. And they all tend to be superb communicators as well. Um, the example you gave Chinmaya was actually a medical doctor. But even without that, this is not rocket science. You don't need to be an Einstein to figure out how to stop a virus from spreading from me to you if I have it, right? You put up barriers. Either you tell me to wear a mask, you tell me to stay at home, you tell me to get myself tested. And all you need to do is to ensure that everything, that there's enough, test, there's enough testing kits, that information flows well, and that me, the infected person, knows exactly where what I'm supposed to do. Do I, how do I get to a test center? I need to be told what is going to happen there. Should I stay at home? Will somebody give me food? That's all you really need. That level of, it, it's really down to our district level administration, to our municipalities, to our panchayats. If you, if they are empower, and this is another horrible word, like system, empowered. I don't, we don't even know what that really means. But if maybe if power is more decentralized to them and we have systems, because they are more responsive at the end of the day, right? Um, not always. It doesn't mean that these are perfect systems of government. But your panchayat member is somebody who sees the people who vote for him every day. He doesn't go and live in Delhi, right? Um, they're much more responsive. Um, and they know what they need to do to, to stay in power. They, and it is this level of responsiveness you see at lower levels of governance, which need to be strengthened. They need to be empowered a lot more. Uh, and all of this is happening already. And you can see the difference between different states as well. The states that have done the best, I think, are probably the ones, and this is just off the top of my head, I have no data on this, with the strongest systems of local governance as well as good primary healthcare systems and sort of really good uh, disease control thing. Um, so to come back um, uh, to your question, yes, the system of public health is, it, it, it's, it's basically after, you know, it's never been well funded. Um, it's slightly better than perhaps than what it was. Our, vaccina our childhood vaccination programs actually are doing well. Um, uh, maternal and child care, childhood vaccination. Um, these are good because they are really supported by global programs and there are UN goals and so on. And so the government is responsive to that. But in other areas, no. 
And uh, unfortunately, everybody goes to a private doctor. Not because they want to, but because that's all and they have to. That's all, you know, you go to your primary health care center. They may not be, the doctor may not be there. Uh, there are no supplies there. The, you know, uh, the place is shut. And nobody turned up for work. All of that happens. So the poorest, the bulk of India, from the poorest to the richest, go to private health care facilities, uh, which are good for clinical medicine, treating ailments and so on, but they're not good at preventing disease. That's where you need a public health system, which has been neglected despite the experiences that of over a hundred years that Chinmay has written about. So we learn nothing from that. Or maybe we, we definitely did not learn enough from that. Um, and so the question really in my mind as as the world gets rebuilt, uh, a post-pandemic world emerges, is how do we ensure that um, our public health defenses, our health security is also ensured, uh, both at the global level, as well as national level, state level, community level. Um, and these are a lot of big words at the moment. Um, and 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 uh, the way, but these are things I think that really need to be done. Um, just as at the end of a war, 1962 war, uh, what happened after that? The importance of the army, modernizing the army, all of these things. Uh, people saw the need for that. Suddenly, that became the the need of the hour. Similarly, after this, um, I do hope that. Um, protecting ourselves from pathogens uh, is seen as the need of the hour um, for our, you know, for our own futures as well as for future generations. Yeah, sure. absolutely. I mean, you know, nothing much to add. I think, you know, he's really covered everything. Uh, I just like to, you know, point out also accountability from politicians. I don't mm -hmm. think health has really been a election level issue until maybe now the pandemic maybe the kerala government came back to powers maybe that had something to do with you know pandemic management but you know if you see the manifestos they might mention him but the burning question in our election manifesto is typically jobs it could be prices you know inflation down onion prices got the government down in the past but i have not seen any government collapse because of bad health and i'll tell you um, you know i'm based in gujarat and gujarat is touted for the gujarat model and it has done really well in terms of, say, electricity, you know, uh, basic infrastructure on the kind of roads and uh, so that's the kind of very different physical infrastructure side. But Gujarat is, is is a state which performs miserably on health, uh, and health has never really been an election issue. Surprisingly, because if you see the the indicators, they are very stark. They are as bad as some of the worst performing states in India, which is not something that you would look at, uh, look up to Gujarat for. Uh, so, you know, so Gujarat seemed to be an industrial power, but it, it does very poorly on health. So I, I think hopefully the pandemic also pushes people to really demand accountability on health. Because I think without that push, you know, if it's not going to be on the election manifesto as a major burning issue, nothing is changing. And I, I, I'm going to be very skeptical, unfortunately, uh, because now that I've seen this history, now I've seen after 1918, the politicians said in parliament, back back to the, Senate, the legislative assemblies, saying we have to invest more in you know, health and so on. And you know, 100 years later, we're still one of the, the least underfunded health systems in the world. So it really, it's, the change starts, you know, I think I really like what Thomas was saying about the point of SARS and China. Uh, the fact that you know, authoritarian states like China also was forced to kind of you know, say never again. Uh, I hope this pandemic really you know, brings out, and we have successful examples from India. Again, crisis prone changes. You know, food crisis of the 1960s, today we are on millions of tons of food grains. Uh, forex crisis of 1991, today we have half a trillion dollars of foreign exchange reserves. So if you have an oxygen crisis today, you know, we should have enough oxygen to support us on the moon, maybe, you know, 30 years down the line. Uh, I think we'll, we'll end, uh, end this year on, uh, on the note that uh, the current crisis, and it is a crisis, I and mean, whether we call it uh, one or not, but uh, we, we are witnessing, we are in the middle of a crisis, a health crisis, which has implications uh, across sectors. I mean, the economy is the most obvious one. Uh, India's status uh, in, in uh, world affairs is going to be another one. I think there was an article in the Hindu today, uh, you know, talking about that, you know, post-COVID India, 
uh, what will India relations with neighbors and uh, with uh, global powers be like, uh, given the, this current context of how uh, badly we seem to be handling uh, the epidemic, the, the, the pandemic. Uh, but uh, as both of you pointed out in, in different ways, uh, crisis is also an opportunity. And I think, you know, I'm, again, it is something like, uh, well, history, we learn from history. Uh, crisis is an opportunity, but it is. I mean, uh, and there are good examples of that. Uh, you know, uh, you have a war and you rebuild. Uh, you have uh, you have a food crisis and you produce more. Uh, so, uh, out of this pandemic, perhaps uh, we'll uh, do more for our healthcare system. Uh, we'll invest more in uh, public health. We'll invest uh, more in education. At this point, it is all wishful thinking. Uh, nobody knows. Uh, you know. The one part of the title of uh, today's discussion was past, present, future. I think uh, <laughs> all of us wisely don't want to go there <laughs> into the future, other than say that, uh, you know, uh, we all, as long as we stay safe or manage to stay safe, uh, we can all, uh, you know, do something about, uh, about the future, uh, about building, uh, rebuilding uh, India in the post-pandemic era. On this note, uh, I would like to thank everyone who took time to... Uh, off to join us. Uh, we went a little over our uh, 60 minutes, but uh, I see that lots of people have uh, still have stayed behind. And uh, thank you, Thomas, and thank you, Chinmay, for, uh, for a very enlightening uh, discussion on, on uh, the current pandemic and past pandemics. Thank you once again. Thank you. Thank you for having me.